14th domain, motif, good grief. So let's talk about um, the, how we, these different terms that we can use to describe different parts of a protein and what those parts do, what they look like. Um, so with domains, you can think of them kind of like rooms in your apartment. And with motif, it's more like furniture in those individual rooms. But there's a lot of wiggle room between these terminology. And you can have structural domains, you can have functional domains, and motifs, and all of these various things. So let's dive in and look at some examples and some more details. Sort of like look at a food label, you would see just like protein and it would be like some amount of protein. But I feel like proteins are a huge diversity of proteins. Proteins are like the molecular workers in your cells and they're doing all sorts of different things. And different parts of proteins do different things. And often we can classify parts of proteins based on what they do or what they look like. And we can use terms like domains and motifs. And their terminology between them, there's like some wiggle room and there's not like clear definitions. But how I like to think of it is a protein domain is kind of like a room in an apartment. So you might have a bedroom and a bathroom and a kitchen. And depending on your apartment, these might be walled off. These would be kind of like structural units, like they're separate rooms. Or if you're in like a studio apartment or an efficiency apartment, they're all kind of just in there together. But there's distinct functions of the different parts. So one part has your microwave and all of your kitchen stuff. One part has your toilet and your showers, your bathroom. One part has your bed. Um, and so you have these different kind of like functional domains. And so we can think about protein domains in terms of being a structural domain. These are often regions of the protein that can like fold independently and you could separate it from the rest of the protein. It would still fold up, it would still act normally. Um, and this is great for us when we want to study these parts of a protein. And these may or may not be associated with a specific function. You can also have functional domains that may or may not be able to fold independently. So, for example, if you had a protein, maybe part of one room is attached to another, I don't know. But basically, when a protein folds up, regions of the protein that were far away can become closer together. So this is an example we're gonna get into later, but this is um, a polynucleotide kinase. What it's gonna do is it's gonna recognize damaged DNA and fix it. And it's going to do this with a couple of different activities. So it has these different regions of the protein. You can see they're colored nicely in different colors, so you can see it nicely. Um, in this case, the regions are all in a line, and so like you could separate the sequence and they would still be able to fold independently and all of this stuff. These are nice structural domains, but they're also functional domains. So this part is um, associated with kinase activity. We'll get into this later. This part was phosphatase activity and this part would kind of like binding to the proteins that are present at the site of damage. So these have distinct functions um, and they can be separated. Um, and this is great when they're trying to study what these different regions do. But the regions don't always have to be separatable. Um, and often there are connections between different regions of the protein that are really important for its function. So this is a protein that I studied in undergrad. You don't need to worry about what it actually does, but it's this RNA interference protein. It's really cool and I have a lot more on it. But it has these distinct domains and you can see that the protein leaps and these domains kind of move uh, like by themselves or in combination. Um, and so proteins are flexible, they move around, and actually the, this, it's holding this RNA. And this part of the RNA is actually held by components of multiple domains. So although we can classify these different domains, in order to bind RNA, in order to have this like functional domain, you actually have to have the uh, multiple, multiple structural domains. Um, so the idea of like a domain, there's different ways that you can define it, and people might be talking about different things when they're talking about a domain, but often we're talking about these kind of like distinct larger parts of a protein. If you look at um, off, these are often like evolutionarily conserved, and there's a site called PFAM that I like that's actually getting like um, decommissioned. And I'll show you an alternative in a bit. Um, but you often see domains laid out like this in this kind of like domain structure where they're showing you the different domains of the protein. And then you can actually go and look and see what else other proteins share these domains. So often 
um, these domains, because they're often these like isolated units, they can kind of be swapped between different proteins in evolution and build upon these different units. And so you could end up with proteins that do similar things um, or maybe they don't even do similar things, but one has like, a, they both die in DNA or something, and then they do different things with them, but they had share that same like DNA binding domain. Um, speaking of which, domains can often um, contain motifs. So you might have like a DNA binding domain, which is the part of the protein, that this bigger part of the protein that actually does the function of binding to DNA. But you have a specific part in that domain, a specific thing that's actually binding to the DNA. So this would be kind of like your motif, um, which would be kind of like furniture in a room. Um, these may or may not have a known function, but they're often evolutionary conserved and shared by many proteins. So domains are often like, they can be shared by multiple proteins, um, but they're typically more distinctive of a various of a protein or of a family of proteins. Whereas motifs is kind of like more common, like a chair, say. You might have a chair in different, re different rooms in your house, um, but you might have chairs in all sorts of different buildings and all of this various things. These chairs serve a particular purpose and they're distinctive, but they're not unique to that protein or that family of proteins. They're not really, they don't really, they could tell us a lot, but they're not like, they're not special, well, they're special, but they're not super duper duper special, if that makes sense. And so um, in, for example, you might have a DNA binding protein with this zinc finger motif. This is a common motif that's found in these proteins that bind to DNA. Uh, some other common motifs are like zinc fingers, beta turns, helix turn helix, beta hairpin, walker AB, binding motifs. Um, so some of these are just like, oh yeah, we can see that it looks this way. Um, so it has this helix and it has this turn and it has this other helix. Um, so we've got this motif. And maybe you also see that in some other proteins. But maybe it just serves a function um, in terms of making the protein have the right shape to do something else. So it's not directly involved in anything. Other times, these domains, can, these motifs can actually be directly involved with things and have these associated functions, like these zinc finger motifs, where the zinc, um, these proteins kind of like holding the zinc molecule here, and this is kind of making things in the right shape and orientation and everything that is going to fit nicely and bind this DNA groove. So you often find these, D these zinc finger protein motifs um, found in proteins in the sites that bind to DNA. These motifs are often what we call like super secondary motifs. And so secondary structure is, those are like the individual beta strands. And so alpha helices, they're formed by interactions between the protein, um, between the protein backbone. And so proteins have these different levels of structure, um, starting with the sequence of amino acids. So the individual protein letters when they link up, they have this generic backbone and then these unique side chains or these or groups that stick off. And so when we talk about like tertiary structure that's involving these side chains, but when we talk about secondary structure that's involving the backbone atoms. Um, and the, com the two most common like structural um, like core structures, structural units are like these beta strands and these alpha helices because of the way that you have this regulatory regularity regular um, pattern in this backbone where you have these alternating like donors and acceptors and more on this in other posts. But these form these attractions called hydrogen bonds that are able to, um, that are best kind of situated, um, get the best bonding in these particular conformations, these shapes um, and these structures where you get these strands and these helices. So basically it's just comfy for the protein. Um, and this is involving just the backbone. And then you can have those sheets and those um, other strands can link up and form like these sheets. You can have sheets and helices and various loops and all these different things that can come um, as like secondary, super secondary motifs where you have these secondary backbone structure units arranged in a distinct way. Um, and then you can also have like tertiary motifs where more things get involved. Um, and then you're getting into the domain or domains when you have like these larger, um, these larger units, but typically when we're talking about a motif, we're talking about something small um, and 
Yeah, we can also talk about motifs in terms of like DNA or RNA motifs. So maybe we've been talking about sites on a protein that bind to DNA, but you can also have sites on DNA and the bind to protein. And so um, you often see motifs represented as this sort of like consensus sequence or one of those like probability logos. We have a sequence text with letters of different sizes representing um, what size, uh, like what's the probability of this, um, this nucleotide, this DNA letter being in a particular position. Basically it'd be like a sequence that likes to bind to a particular protein. Um, so we can talk about motifs and proteins as well as motifs in DNA, motifs in RNA. Um, these are commonly we're talking about these um, smaller units with some function or some structure that makes them like identifiable. That's something that we can use to discuss it. So it's not that there's necessarily something special about a particular chair in the house, um, but um, it gives us a way to talk about it other than say, oh, it's that thing where you have those four things sticking down, and then you have that flat thing, and then you have this other thing. So chair gives us a way to describe the thing. Um, and so in this case, it also tells us a bit about function, but it doesn't necessarily have to be something that tells us about function. Um, but that's just the basic idea with motifs and domains. Um, now let's look at an actual example of where this comes into play because I think it helps simplify things. Oh, so and just um, domains can also be like catalytic domains. So these are like areas of a protein that of an enzyme. So a reaction speeder upper, um, reaction mediator that actually do the work. Um, so you can have like a catalytic triad would be an example of a motif that you find in some proteases, so those like protein chewers. Um, and here's our zinc finger we were talking about before. And so you can see that there's different um, structure motifs, and you can actually search for proteins by motif in the protein database. Okay, so now let's get into this really cool example. Um, so first, another way you can kind of think about domains in sense is like you would think about um, think about like a Swiss Army knife and how different parts of it can do different things. So not only we have different domains of a protein do different things. Um, and if we want to figure out what different parts do, we can, if they're structural domains, we can often like separate these um, and study them on their own. Or we can make mutations in the different domains and see if they affect the protein structure function and how. And so for this example, we're going to be looking at this protein called polynucleotide kinase phosphatase or PNKP. Um, this protein is really cool, and what it does is it has the function of fixing, helping fix boo-boos in your DNA. So when there's any um, like damage that you get in, in this DNA, so one of the strands gets cut, this protein can come help repair it, or at least get it ready for repair by a DNA ligase or by a protein that can actually stitch things together. Basically, what happens is when the pro when the DNA gets split. The ends, the way it splits it, it's not compatible for joining back together by the ligase. You're left with, um, in some cases, you're left with like a three prime phosphate and a five prime OH. What the ligase needs, what the stitching needs, is a five prime um, phosphate and a three prime OH. So, what this polynucleotide kinase phosphatase does is it has to actually recognize the site of the damage. It has to um, dephosphorylate one part, so it has to act as a phosphatase, remove the phosphate group from this part, and then it has to act as a kinase and add the phosphate group to the five prime end. So it has these three distinct functions that it has to do, and these functions are actually carried out by the different domains of this group. So it's a really great example for, um, for displaying this. And so scientists can actually make mutations in the various regions and show that it would lose the different functions. So the kinase domain, that's going to be involved in adding the phosphate group from ATP. So it needs to be able to bind ATP. So within this bigger kinase domain, we have a motif that can bind ATP. Um, so Walker A B motif, um, and this is a common ATP binding motif, where you actually uh, you can see that the protein these these different amino acid residues, so the different parts of the protein letters that are involved with actually binding to the ATP. They're not next to each other in sequence, but when the protein folds up, they come together and you can see that you get this site um, where you can find ADP. 
the rings are often also conserved between related proteins. So you have the um, like mammalian polynucleotide kinase and the T4 polynucleotide kinase. So T4 is this phage, this bacteria infecting virus. We actually take advantage of its T4 polynucleotide kinase. Um, and what we're showing here is just the kinase subunits. And in the lab, we actually can buy just that kinase subunit without the phosphatase activity so that we can take advantage of the kinase to label the like RNA or DNA with a radioactive or a fluorescent um, phosphate from the ATP without having to worry about the kinase then removing it. Um, and so by knowing more about these different domains, we can better understand this. And you can see that these different domains can be conserved between the proteins. Um, so that's the basics of proteins and domains. And let me now just show you that in the database really quick. All right, so before I showed you this site called Unaprop, um, which you can use to like, find information about like any protein ever. It's really awesome. If you go to this family and domains, it will show you the different domains of the protein if they are known. Um, and then you can get information about the domains. You can also, uh, do, 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 do. See here, you can um, see that you have this triad supposed to be like a motif within that Kiwi domain. Um, but you can also see if you can go to these different databases to find information about like evolution and conservation, et cetera, et cetera. And if you go to this um, key fan, which is the site that I showed you before, um, this is actually getting redirected to this other site, um, this interpro site. Um, but you can see that you're still, you can see all this information about the different domains. It'll tell you which regions of the protein are the different domains. And then if you click on those, it'll show you in the protein. And then you could search it um, for similar proteins that have the fold and various things like that. Um, and so there's lots of cool stuff here that you can um, play around with and check out.